everybody, Death Spread here. Welcome back to Your Daily Zero, the series where I take a look at games with zero player accounts on Steam at the time of installation. All right, to, maybe if you look up the title right now of the game, you'll find on Steam charts that there are some people playing it currently, but at the time of installing the game, there are zero players. If you're interested to see exactly how I choose these games, check out the first video in the first 10 minutes. I explain what the series is, how I choose the games, and many more things about the series itself. Otherwise, I hope you guys are having a great day. Happy July 10th. Hope you're having a great... What is that? Uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday? I hope you're having a great Monday. <laughs> and I hope you guys have your coffee. Hope you guys have your banana. And let's jump into today's zero-player count game called Sabres of Infinity. Let's jump into it. Alright, so, quick side note. I never do any research into the games that I install. Which, if you read the description in all these videos, you'll see that I do talk about... Uh, there are bad actors on Steam that can get different types of viruses through Steam's safety protocols when you upload a game to be downloaded to the Steam store. So always be careful when you're installing these. I never claim that these are 100% clean because I might even put it, be putting my own computer at risk. I truly don't know. That said, I don't, I don't really look at anything. I just look at, does it have 50 to 80 reviews-ish and about two to 500-ish total hours played on the game itself and its history. At that point, I consider it a little bit safer than a game with nothing, no no reviews, no, no hours played ever. But even still, just be careful when you're downloading games. Now, this game, I probably put music in the background. So if you listen to music in the background, great. Because uh, I didn't realize there was no music in here. But yeah, this is Sabres of Infinity, and I guess it's a text-based game. I don't really, I'm not entirely sure. So let's uh, let's get to reading. I feel like I'm doing a crypto podcast, which, if I'm correct, on Saturday, uh, we'll we'll talk about that another day. Don't worry about it. By Paul Cataphrac Wang, 2013. Author's note: Sabres of Infinity takes place in the Infinite Sea, a fantasy setting possessed of functional magic, among other extraordinary phenomena. It is a setting where wealth, class, gender, allegiance, and birth restrict a person's role in society. Its magical and social politics are not consistent with stories starring protagonists whose experiences are largely ident uh, identical regardless of class or sex. Thus, the player character is required to be a young man of noble, noble birth for purely pragmatic reasons. Characters of, of other genders and social classes would have their own radically different stories to tell, but those stories are for another time. All right. I'm glad to give a legitimate reason to it all. What's the menu real quick? Return, quit, view achievements, restart game, change settings, play more games like this, share this game with friends, uh, email, view the credits, blah, 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 blah. Okay, return to the game. And then I assume you just choose whatever one you want and hit next. Prologue. Being the arrival of a young officer of the Royal Dr Dragoon Regiment, at the old fortress of Fernand Discord. Fernand Discord. Okay, sure. The harsh Kunarian sun beats down upon you as you step off the running board of your family's coach and onto the manicured courtyard of Fern F Fern and Descort's old fortress. The smell of horse manure and raw iron assaults your nostrils as a group of uh, uniformed men thunder past on horses, herded by a stout, red-faced sergeant. Under one soldier, shold, soldier, under one shoulder, you carry a leather binder which holds the key to the rest of your life. A commission as a cornet in the Royal Dragoon Regiment, signed by His Majesty the King himself. With it sits an order to report to your new squadron commanding officer, Captain Alfred de Al Montez at Fernand Descourt immediately upon I struggle saying that immediately upon your arrival. With one hand held over your temple to shield your eyes from the sun's glare, you quickly find what you are looking for. The open door to the old stone fort citadel, where you will begin your career as an officer of his Royal Majesty's of His Majesty's Royal Dragoons. You step through the heavy iron banded doors into the blissfully cool interior of the citadel, only to be nearly bowled over by the rush of clerks and aides scrambling to and fro like enraged hornets. The outbreak of war with the League of Antar had come as a shock to no one. Still smarting from... Smarting? Okay. Still smarting from previous slights, the great and powerful lords of the League Congress saw their opportunity for vengeance appear when the untested teenage Prince Miguel succeeded his father upon the Griffin throne of Tira. 
Tyera. I'll say Tyera. Sounds better. It had been a calculated diplomatic move, or so the other, or so the men of stately affairs had said. The Antares had expected the new king to cave. They had not foreseen the young monarch's response as he mobilized his fleet and army with determined force. They certainly had not expected the king to land troops on the Antares mainland itself. Now the entire country is abuzz as regiments like the Royal Dragoons ready themselves for battle, waiting to join the rest of the army across the Cal. Cal Caligian C. All right, there we go. So this is, I guess this is the game you read. It's almost like uh, choose your own adventure text-based story from you know like the early '90s and '80s, which is kind of cool. We don't see a lot of those, especially nowadays. So that, I, I I don't know. It's it's nice. I do wish I had music, but that's fine. Small complaint. The great central chamber of the old fortress is a hive of activity. Staff officers and their aides move about in self-centered trajectories. A team of clerks push counters and check notes. With, written on the maps which sit atop the tables in the center of the room. On the wall above them, an oil portrait of the Duke of Cunneries, the regimental commander, peers down benef ben beneficently upon his flesh and blood subordinates. While it would probably be a good idea to report to your future commanding officer immediately, it might also it might also do to take a look around and familiarize yourself with the fortress. You report in immediately. I should try to make good impression on my first superiors observe the men training outside i might be able to pick up some po uh, pointers try to talk to some other junior officers and get some advice i ah, report immediately i'm a soldier right gotta do what you gotta do captain montez's office smells of old leather and stale coffee the man himself is a small pinched fa pinch faced fellow a pair of spectacles balance on atop the bridge of his short stubby nose he greets you formally and offers you a seat I had the fortune to witness your arrival, he begins, waving at the open window behind him. Do not doubt that I will find it, that I find it most gratifying when new officers are prompt in following of simple instructions. I hope you will prove most useful to us. You hand over your commission papers and orders. Montez scans over them quickly, his eyes darting back and forth between his steel-rimmed spectacles. The captain picks up a waiting quill pen and signs the papers with a fluid hand, making your commission fully official. Dropping the document in a drawer, he shuffles through another pile of papers atop of his desk, pulling one out. I am afraid that we shall need to go through a few formalities first, for the record, you understand. Montez picks up the quill pen to get ready to write. Give a name. Today, I want to be Alaric. I don't like any of those names. Family name, Alaric San Croix. Yeah. Very well then, Alaric Deal San Croix. Shall we take a moment to clarify a few facts about your early life and origins? Sure. The unified kingdom of Tierra is normally ruled by 16-year-old King Miguel of House Rendower. Advising him are his privy council men of high birth and enormous power, namely the official heads of the army, fleet, civil service, and intendancy, or home office. Below them sit the courts... What is that? The courts? Yeah. The courts, composed of the heads of the hundreds of noble houses that make up the bulk of the Tyrian aristocracy. The courts provide the greatest check to the king's power the ability to vote on the royal budget while the king can give decrees without restraint only the courts can vote him the money to carry them out the members of these two bodies are the entire are the titled members of bane blooded noble houses like your own each with unique positions in a complex feudal system of obligations and privileges though quirks of history and by the vagaries i guess of fealty tierra itself is divided into several culturally distinct regions which these regions is your family from? That was a lot of backstory for just where you come from. The north, the economic powerhouse of Tierra, a land of iron mines and mills. The western coast, storm-swept and desolate, home to rough tides and tough men. The eastern plains, where, where Farin discords stand. Home to some of the best horsemen in the unified kingdom. Or Aetoria, the capital city, a center of culture and education. Uh, let's go with the horsies. Yeah. The Eastern du Duchy of Cunaris is famous for the caliber of its solder soldiery, especially its cavalry. Oh my god, the words are needlessly complex. You grew up to the... Maybe they're not complex, I'm just blonde, but I mean, I'm just saying, man. Uh, you grew up to the smell of horse manure and gunpowder. You, Your liege lord, the Duke of Cunaris, happens to be the colonel of the Royal Dragoons, and as such, you were expected to join his regiment from an early age. Ah! meeting requirements early your family is nobility of an old but relatively impoverished line dating from before the days of edwin the strong 
Although your house's material fortunes have waned over the past few decades, your family still bears a proud name and represents a fair amount of influence and capital. Like the descendant of any noble family, you were born a bane blood. That is to say, you have the ability to sense the bane or life poison, what commoners might call, quote unquote, the force of magic. The bane exists in all living creatures. It binds us, penetrates us. <laughs> Those with exceptionally strong bane blood are capable of manipulating the bane in all living things. These people are called bane casters. Although your bloodline is not strong enough to actively manipulate the bane, you are perfectly capable of sensing it when it is being used by others or when live it, live in it, living things like human beings gather in sufficient concentration. Of course, there are other signs of a bane casting in progress. Even the most powerful human casters require a series of endroomed seals to work their art. This makes bane casting time consuming and tedious, fit only for the most extraordinary necessities. It is said that the elves of Takara can manipulate the bane without such seals. But Takara is far away, and for the moment, none of your concern. Let's move on, shall we? Your house still owns a substantial estate where you were born, educated, and raised in a state of some privileges. Perhaps you had always wanted to be a soldier. Perhaps the notion had not occurred to you until recently. Nonetheless, it was the recent news of war with Antar that spurred you into action. At what age did you make a faithful decision to join, join the Dragoons? You got him from, you know, got him from the youth, man. Age 14. You're exceedingly young. That's for sure. The clerk at Grenadier Square nearly laughed in your face when you stepped up to buy your commission. Let's hope your youthful and experience doesn't cripple your career overly. Overtly. While your family may not have enthusiastically supported your decision to go to war, they understood the necessity of sending a son to fight for the king and country. As a result, you left your home with your family's grudging pride. In addition, they presented you with a parting gift. A bane cast sword with a blade sharper than any normal seal. I'm not going to do anything bane casting if I can't even cast bane. A custom made uniform, which would make me stand out in a crowd. Yeah, that's a good way to get picked on. A set of books on philosophy and the natural sciences. Eh. A letter of introduction to the colonel of the regiment praising my talents. A letter of credit uh, with a letter of credit worth a substantial amount of money. I mean, money is pretty important. 75 crowns is a pricely sum equal to your entire family's income for three months. Woo! It is certainly enough money to buy your way into army society or into the good graces of your future subordinates. Armed with your gifts, you left your home and bought your commission in the capital city of Ertoria at Grenadier Square, the stately headquarters of the Royal Army. There, you learn that commissions are more prestigious regiments like the Grandier Guards and the Wolfheads... I, I, what is that word? Curiaciers? <laughs> I have no idea. Had been in such high demand that their prices had been inflated far beyond your meager monetary means. The best you could afford was a cornet's commission in the Royal Dragoons. It is hardly the most celebrated of regiments, but its rank and file are no band of thieves and thugs like the line infantry regiments either. Your new posting promises to be a respectable, if not overly prestigious one. Very good. Drink some water. You finish recounting the story of your circumstances to Captain Montez. Satisfied, he stands the complete do he hands the complete dossier over to you for your signature. You sign and push the folder back. Montez puts the packet of documents away and turns back to you. It is done then. Welcome to the Royal Dragoons, Cornet Saint Croix. Your dormitory room is a third on the left. You shall be sharing it with two other cornets, Casarosta and Elson. They have been in training for a few weeks already, so learn what you can from them. Your equipment and uniform shall be sent up to your room. You will, of course, be allowed to keep any personal additions to kit as long as they conform to uniform regulations. Montez sits back in his chair with an air of fi finality. Your training begins tomorrow. Relieve is at 6 o'clock sharp. You are dismissed. Progress saved. Should you die in the next chat? I just joined the army. I'm not even trained yet. I come from the, 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 the swamps. And you're telling me, should I die in the next chapter? What? What? Am I going to get killed by a fellow soldier? What? Okay. Should you die in the next chapter, you may return to this point in time. Be warned that this only applies to your current session. Quitting. Wipe all of your checkpoints? What? What? Seriously? So, so if I quit this game, I have to do all this again. What kind of nonsense is that, man? That That's crazy. That is... Wow. So... It's a, it's a temporary save file then. It's not even... It's not even a save file. Man, that is brutal. <laughs> well, let's go just a little bit further. Um, 
Because, again, the point of this series is just to get a little bit of a taste of each game with zero players to you guys. And maybe see why it has zero players. And I'm starting to get the feeling... I know text-based adventures aren't exactly popular nowadays. Especially right now in the age of Call of Duty. And, uh... Yeah, that whole, uh... That whole saving thing. Not a fan. Not a fan of that. If I actually cared about this game... I'm, I'm gonna be honest. Let's go a little bit further. Chapter 1. Being the cavalry officer's time of training at Fernandez Corps and the introduction of several companions and potential rivals. At first glance, your new lodging is hardly as suitable for a man of noble birth. The chamber in which you will be sleeping for the duration of your training is a cramped and dusty affair, poorly lit and heavily built. The low vaulted ceiling is just battered and worn enough to remind you of a prison cell. The as as acerid? Okay. The acid reek of old gunpowder clings to every surface. You get the distinct impression that your new bunk room used to be some sort of powder magazine. The room itself is sparsely furnished, possessing naught but three narrow cots arranged along the walls with a table and chairs in the center. At the tables sits a slim, large-nosed boy of about 16, his light brown hair tied back into a long queue. He wears a shirt of cream-colored silk with silver lion heads embroidered tastefully over the rolled-up sleeves. The green-gray jacket of a Royal Dragoon officer hangs, carefully folded from the back of his chair. He nods at you coldly as you enter, barely paying you any mind. His attention is firmly affixed to the flintlock pistol in his hands. You watch for a few moments as he works over a delicate steel lock mechanism with an oil cloth, practiced hands polishing every crevice with hinge and well-practiced ease. A full minute passes before the boy stops and sets the pistol down apparently finished he looks up his eyebrows furrowed in annoyance oh hello his voice is flat hard and flat who are you uh i uh <laughs> your new roommate uh yeah let's let's be formal cornet alaric dayal san croix at your service the boy stands up setting the cloth carefully on the table he hands you a respectful nod caius dayal castorza ta at yours he shows a hard, thin slash of a grin as he, he offers his hand to be shook, but you notice very little warmth behind the smile. His dark eyes remain as flint hard as they were before. He is putting on a show for your benefit, but at least he is now making the effort to be hospitable. Well, you know, look on the right. The door swings open again. A small, pale boy in his late teens strides through. His sandy blonde hair is d disheveled and his alabaster skin covered with bruises and scalps, some half-healed and some fresh. He is filthy all over. Dirt and sweat are heavily smeared over his fine features. The stink of his leather and the horse manure trails behind him as he makes his way into the far bunk. He takes one glance at you and Casarosta, still in mid-handshake, and shakes his head with disgust. Casarosta gives a cold chuckle. That would be Elson, Lord Davis Deal Elson. First son to the Baron of Hawthorne, he says, just loud enough for the other boy to hear. Associate with him as you would like, but do not expect me to weep with you, should your poor idiot friend get himself killed. You already calling him my friend? I said two words to you, and you're already calling him my friend. Buddy, how do you know I don't want you to be my friend? Hmm? Elson lays down on his cot and makes a conscious effort to ignore two of you. He flashes out a small, well-worn book of... Oh, fishes out, not flashes. Uh, worn-out book from the pocket of his trousers begins to read. You realize what would now be a good time to try to get to know your new roommates. Although Elson is now, at least pretending to be, fully engrossed by his book, you still have Cardoza's full... Cardoza. Casarosa's full attention and perhaps his friendship. Do you? Ask him about his bruises. Ask Cardoza about Elson's book. Ask Cardoza about himself. Uh, Casarosa about himself. I excuse myself and get some sleep before tomorrow's training. Let's excuse ourselves. I don't want to overstay my welcome. You dress for bed and lay yourself down on the thin, lumpy mattress. The blankets are made of uniformly, un uniformly gray and rough wool, but serve well enough. The lumpy cot takes some getting used to, but it is your wandering thoughts that keep you awake. You wonder what the coming days and years will bring and whether you will ever get used to sleeping away from the cozy comfort of your own bedroom back at home. Finally, your mind becomes too weary to continue and meanders to m no more. You fall into a deep, dreamless sleep. All right. I've been going for about 23 minutes. Cut this down maybe about 15 minutes worth of gameplay. Uh, yeah, this is Sabres of Infinity. It's a little bit different. I won't lie. It, it's not what I expected. I'll put it that way. Um, it, it, it's it's different. Again, I just download a bunch of zero-player games according to Steam Charts website that you can find in the description down below. And at, at the time of installation, I only have zero players. I've said multiple times. And it's, uh, it's not something I'll ever look into, right? 
So to see this game go so far back to like text-based adventures, it's it's kind of cool. It's different. It's different. I didn't ex I, I didn't expect that. Obviously, nobody would expect that when opening a random game, but uh, I, I I appreciate the details in here. I mean, from consistency in the story in the first 20 minutes to just like the choices seeming to have a little bit of weight, at least in the short term. Uh, it's cool. It's very interesting. It's very nice. I do wish it was music though. But you guys got music, hopefully, if I don't forget. And other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, yeah, this was Sabers of Infinity. I hope you guys have a wonderful Monday. Thank you for spending your morning with me. And other than that, uh, I guess, I mean, I know there wasn't a whole lot going on in this episode, but hey, we got to read a little bit of a fun little story. So anyway, I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed, please just hit the like button and show your support because it motivated me more videos just like this one. And remember that somebody somewhere loves you and you don't know it yet. Hopefully, I'll see you tomorrow. If not, I'll see you when I see you. Take care, guys, and have a wonderful day. See ya.